What we see now, Riaz is killing it, man. He's been sponsored by Gymshark. He's been sponsored by MyProtein. He's got 126K followers, but they don't know the backstory of how you build that audience for starters. What it took, the blood, sweat and tears. Wallahi, it's, it's not what it looks like. I promise you, bro, it's not what it looks like. Sometimes I'm sat there, bro. I'm sat there for an hour and I look at my laptop and then I start crying, bro. <sighs> I didn't really want to say this, but... Right, right, right. Listen, before we get into it, I'm going to ask you a couple of rapid fire questions. All right, okay, go for it. You ready, yeah? Which one do you enjoy more, online coaching or videography? Oh, that's a tricky one. Um, I'm going to go with online coaching. Why? I can reach more people and in terms of a value aspect, I can provide more value than I do with videography. When it comes to the online coaching business, what is one thing that clients say, do or expect that annoys you the most? So I've turned away clients before where it's like, okay, look, I've got a wedding in two months and I want to get to X weight. And I'm like, bro, I'm sorry, bro. Like I don't work. You can do that. And there are coaches that do that, that will work on like a, on a, on an instant transformation. But that's not what I do really is I work, I work with clients who want to do something long-term. Other than that, if you're not willing to put it, put the work in and the hours in, then go home. <laughs> yeah, 100%, man. What What's your ideal client? The ideal client. That you're passionate about, you get up to work with them, you think, you know what, I'd love to work with this person. I had a client and I'll mention him actually. Um, I've worked with over 300 clients, right, over the past three years. And this one client, he stuck out for me. And this one client, he absolutely smashed and he actually changed the way I do my coaching as well. So he's called Danny and he lives in Preston. He's about 27 and wallahi this guy was one of the best transformations i've had in about four months he lost 10 10 kilos right and he he absolutely transformed his body and, I was, uh, and i'll show you the transformation so you can show it on the on the podcast as well but he absolutely transformed and what this guy would do and i actually put this into into my consultation calls now the expectation that i have um, for clients so what he would do is every single day without a miss i'm telling you every single day for about four four and a half months straight he'd send me what he's eating on a daily basis and he'd send every me, day every day bro wow. the guy would not miss he'd send me what he's eating on a daily basis he'd send me his steps on a daily basis so how many steps is doing a day it's tedious yeah because you're sending someone you know what you're eating what you're doing and you know you're keeping someone in check with in, in how everything's going in your life but that's that's the beauty of it i didn't have to tell him to like because i respond to my clients within about 24 hours give or take and this guy i'd open my chat and i'd have like seven messages from danny he said pictures of what he's at pictures of what he, what his steps have done and um, how he's been going how he's connecting even better to his faith how these little things are tying tying in a lot better into his life all because he's found a routine and he didn't actually rely on me i was more kind of had the expectation of him now okay danny's gonna get up and do it and then next thing you know in about four months he's got abs and you know what i mean he's he's, he's shredded and then i was like okay you know what let's see what you can do on your own we hadn't come to an agreement i said okay go you know go do this by yourself for a bit when you want to start bulking let's start again but i had so much faith and belief in him that he can go do it himself that he was just gonna go do it yeah that's the perfect client man i seen you when i asked you that question you lit up you thought of him straight away you're excited you're passionate that's where you get me, up and he's a definition of tying your camel man in that sense isn't it absolutely bro you know absolutely I mean? man and people like that that you that help themselves you want to go out your way and help them even more absolutely. Isn't it? absolutely bro 100 percent, man 100 percent. one thing you wish you had known when you were just starting out in business it's okay to want everything and it's okay to try everything that's an interesting answer because i started off when i was very young and in terms of monetary gain i didn't make money for a lot of time for about four and a half five years from any business model i didn't make any money because i was trying everything everything you could think of i tried I tried um, online drop shipping that didn't work. I lost money in that. I tried trading. I didn't. I didn't have the patience for that as a kid. Um, I tried setting up a recruitment business. I then realized when I when I found businesses that I'm actually providing value and that something that I'm extremely good at. Why don't I do this for coaching? So then I then spent the next year and a half learning, educating myself, and then that's how I started with the coaching. Then from that came the videography and the photography. We're going to definitely need deep dive into all of Course the businesses bro. and all your journey so far. But anyway, yeah, guys, look, welcome to another episode of the Comma Podcast, the number one platform for sharing stories worth telling. So that's your kind of jam. Make sure you hit that subscribe button. Um, for those who haven't come across you, bro, obviously we did a bit of a rapid fire session there. Got a little bit of a flavor of what's to come. Um, give us a little insight on who you are, bro. And what do you do? So my name is Riaz. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, 
I'm 24 years old. Where do I begin? I mean, with what I do, I'm an online coach. Um, I, I work with people all over the world, transforming their lives, transforming their physiques, helping them spiritually. Um, I'm the founder of Creative Focus. It's a videography and a photography agency as well. Specialized mainly in weddings at the moment. I do a lot of um, brand work on social media and I'm also an audiologist. So for those of you who don't know, I'm basically a specialist with ears and hearing loss and anything to do with ears. That's, that's kind of my game. So you're the founder of Creative Focus. You're an online fitness coach. You've got a huge social media presence of currently 126,000 followers. And you're a former Gymshark athlete, currently a my protein athlete. Yep. Smashed it, bro. Doing well, man. No, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. You yeah. know, it's all thanks to Allah's one of And he's got a nine to five job. That, that's, he's managing it all. We're going to get into all of that stuff. Actually. No. I left. That's a good sign, man. Yeah. Because uh, I'm guessing your side hustles replaces. Yeah. So when Jeez. we when we spoke initially, yeah, yeah. Um, this was just as I was going into um, my private role. To put it into context for the people that don't know, so obviously I qualified as an audiologist, and then I didn't work as an audiologist. I went to work as an area manager for Aldi. I know completely different U-turn, <laughs> and then and then I worked as a local audiologist. I moved down south, and then after I then I got my private qualification when I was down south, moved back up north, and then I worked for a company where we basically work with opticians, and I work privately. So I had five clinics uh, which I would rotate around during the week. So Sheffield, Huddersfield on Altrincham and so that's where I'd kind of be based so I did that for the best part of you know uh, December January and then Feb I left in Feb so three three to four months it was very short-lived because you know I was I was drained and there was a lot of things that I couldn't do in terms of from an Islamic perspective and just from a, a business perspective and personal development as well and I can't lie, bro, you know, it was, alhamdulillah, it was a really good salary, but I had to really make a, I had to make a decision as to, am I going to carry on working, am I going to carry on working a, a 95, 96, where I'm, yes, providing a lot of help to patients, and it's a, and it's a big blessing doing it as well, or am I going to go and pursue my businesses, and am I going to pursue what I want to do full time, and just take that big risk, and see where it takes wow. me. Wow, bro, that's amazing. Congratulations, by the way. Thank you, bro. Listen, Appreciate we've got a lot more to talk about now. Yeah, I added, uh, uh, added some questions to my list of questions. So we're going to get into all the juicy stuff, yeah. all that you mentioned there. People are intrigued, man. They want to know how you did it. Mm -hmm. And that's the level that people want to get to, where they can leave their nine to five, exit the matrix, as they say, do you know what I mean? And mm -hmm. you've done it, man. Um, but before we do get into all that juicy stuff, I want to dive into little Riaz, man. I want to take it back, bro. I want to take it back. Um, you were actually born in Germany. I was born here, but right. I moved to Germany for you five years, yeah. And how old was you when you moved to Germany? About two weeks old. Two weeks old? Yeah, wow. roughly. So tell us the story behind all that, man. So my parents, they got married in Germany. So my mum, she got married when she was 18. And back in the days, you know, people got married very, you know, really young. And so she was in college. She then finished college. Well, she didn't get to finish college, so she got married. And then, obviously, they then lived in Germany for a bit, and then... But why? Just, sorry, it's because it's quite... It's, not, it's unusual yeah. going to Germany, so yeah. what so was the story behind that? Obviously, having any, any form of immigrant parents, or if you have an immigrant father, obviously, they'll often go from Bangladesh or Pakistan or India, or to, from, a diff, from there to a different country. So my dad went, emigrated from Bangladesh to Germany. His brothers went from Bangladesh to Italy. Some of the cousins went to France, some went to Russia, some went to Ukraine. So people different, you know, this is... No, I get it now. Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, my dad kind of did a lot to get to Germany. You know what it would have been like back yeah. in them days, bro. You had to do, you know, a lot of things to cross the, cross the border and kind of get to a different country and to have a better life for yourself 100%, and, and then the future as well. So they got married there. And then obviously my mum, she came to the UK um, to give birth to me and then because they already lived there my mum my dad and my sister and we moved back there and we stayed there for five years so for five years I grew up there alhamdulillah it was really great the Muslim community was good in Germany uh, yeah yeah because yeah, it, it was it was a Turkish community so Sick. you know my first best friend he was he was a Turkish guy he's called Ennis um, I don't know where he is anymore but <laughs> yeah, I had a I had a you know a, a good uh, community there and it was a good good homely feeling as well so after Germany, after five years, obviously came to the UK and then the UK was where it was tough for me. For the first year and a half, two years, I couldn't speak in English. So I was I was in I was in class and it was it was difficult because 
whenever somebody was saying something to me and and, and smiling, I thought they're, they're taking the mick out of me. So I'd, oh. get, I'd, get, I'd get aggressive, you know, this little six-year-old Ria. I was like, oh, what did you say? And <laughs> you know what you get what I mean? So... Not gonna lie, that breaks my heart, bro. I've got daughters <laughs> myself, so yeah. I can imagine that. No, Alhamdulillah, man, Alhamdulillah. And it was, I think, for me, because you're as you when you're young, you pick things up like that yeah. really quickly. So it took me about a year and a half to pick up the full English language. So by the time I've reached about seven, I can speak English. And it took me another two years to forget German because I wouldn't speak German. And if you think about what how much German would you actually would you actually rem- um, learn from the ages of not to five? Not that much. The same way if you found a five-year-old toddler now who speaks English and then you move them to a different country, in a few years, if they're not in that environment, they're going to forget it. So I forgot most of it. My mum, obviously, she still speaks it fluently. My sister knows better than me. My dad knows better than to me. To this day? Yeah, to this day. So Nice. So Alhamdulillah, you know, she she helped me with my GCSEs when I did uh, German GCSEs. So she so she actually wrote my um, the assignment for me because we couldn't do it on Google Translate because the teacher would know because the verbs would be in a different context and a different order. So my mum would write it for me. And she'd help me out and then I'd memorize it. And then that's how I did my German GCSE. But that's that, that's how it went, really. Coming to the UK through primary school, my dad was still in Germany. So my dad didn't come to the UK up until I, I can't remember how old I was, but I think I must have been about nine, eight or nine when my dad was finally able to come to the UK from Germany. Five to nine, you didn't have your dad in your life as much. Yeah, so yeah. He, he, he'd be in Germany and um, he wasn't able to come to the UK. And so we lived at my uncle's house and... So it was me, my mom, my sister, my uncle, and a few of my cousins. So then, obviously, my dad came back. To, my dad was able to then come to the UK and then kind of started our life here. And that's that was mid midway through primary school. Okay, interesting, man. Was you close to your dad then? Because he's away for a bit. Did you find it easy to reconnect, or was, is he one of them typical South Asian immigrant dads, or where you don't really talk much? It's just you know. Yes, just, that there's that where we don't really talk much and. It's it just one of them things, you know, I mean, you just have to kind of accept, you know, the only things that we talk about is when it's necessary. Like, say, for example, if I'm at home in the kitchen and he comes home, we don't talk. We, he just does what he needs to do and he goes. If it's just me and my dad in the house, we don't talk. I'll either go out or I'll be in my room. That's just exactly how it is. Um, in terms of when I was a kid, obviously, if you're a kid and you've been around your dad and then he's not there for a few years, you miss him. And, you know, I used to miss him as a kid. And when he came to the UK, because in Germany, you know, he was, you know, Alhamdulillah, he's a brilliant father figure then. He would take me out, we'd spend time with family and he would do the work and everything like that. I think during the time, my mum, she worked in McDonald's and she worked in a factory as well. And then my dad would work in a hotel and um, he's a hotel chef. So a lot of the times my mum and dad would, um, my dad would do the night shifts, my mum would do the day shifts and then kind of spend time looking after us. And then just growing up, I was very close to my dad up until a point, I think when I was about 12, 13. So th- the naughtier and the more I messed about, the more I did, I was distanced from my dad because, like, even to this day, like, if you look at my phone now, I've got him saved as danger dad and really? and, a, and, a, and um, a caution sign and a, and a siren. Yeah. <laughs> so when I was a kid, I used to say I saved him as danger dad because <laughs> <laughs> whenever he'd ring me and I was out with my boys and I'd be in the park, I'd be like 12, 13 years old, you know, up to no good, out until like 9, 10 o'clock and it was dark and the phone would ring and say danger dad. I'd like, oh, I forgot to take my dad's ringing me and he'd be like, where are you? Danger three, dad, you know. <laughs> three, three, four missed calls and... Um, so obviously, I then had a very troublesome relationship. I, I messed. I used to mess around a lot. I used to mess around a lot. And when you say mess around, is that just you hanging out late at night or that kind hanging of thing? around late, late at night? And if you think about it, what do kids do when they're younger? You know, during that age and when they're with their friends. You know, all of them things that you can get into, which we don't need to expose. You know, yeah, in, in a yeah. sense. And obviously, my parents wanted to protect me from that. And you know, my dad always instilled in me, you know, it's not good to have that many friends. And then, you know, I used to say things like, you don't have any friends and, you know, this side and the other, you know, really? some really harsh things as a kid. And astaghfirullah, you know, if I, if I look back at that kid now, I just give him a slap, man. Like the, the, the you know, in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, he says, uh, he says, he says in an ayah, and I'll translate to English, he says, you that you shouldn't even say oof to your parents. You know, you shouldn't even utter the word oof to your parents. And if we think about any of us who have, who have that blessing of having both of our parents or even one of our parents, how many times do we say to our mum out dad, oh, I can't be bothered. No, you do. I'm busy. I'm this. We're all guilty of it. I think everyone goes to that phase. They think they know it best. Yeah. And when you go a bit older, you think, you know what, my parents actually 
right? 100%. Have you come mm-hmm. to that conclusion? 100%, bro. I think when... So I, I changed secondary schools. So the first secondary school that I was in, um, I used to mess around quite a lot there. I used to get in trouble quite a lot. And then... I, so that was year seven and year eight, so 11 and 12. So then when I tried to quote-unquote reform... Um, things that would still happen, I'd get the blame for it in school. So I didn't like that. And during that school, it was a predominantly white school. So I was one of the only Asians. So you could spot an Asian kid, like a, they'd stick out like a, thought, uh, like a sore thumb. And that's what I was. So the culture and the, the religious aspect wasn't there. So, you know, I didn't, my culture was that, you know, I basically had a white culture then because all of my friends, they were, all of my friends were white. And Alhamdulillah, um, a few of them, they really treat me like family. So I, I was a lot into my basketball, a lot into my sports. And um, there's one of my friends in particular, um, I don't really see him anymore, but he's called Lewis. And his parents, they treated me like family. So, you know, I'd be there for the barbecues. Um, I'd be doing chores and he'd, he'd dad give me a fiver. They'd take me to our basketball games. I had another guy, um, Francis, his parents would take me to basketball. Because my parents, because my parents, because... They weren't able to take me, basically, right? And they didn't have the facilities to take me. So a lot of those things, a lot of those friends that I grew up with, yes, even though it was a completely different culture, the ones that I was close to, they really treated me like family. They used to take me to my award ceremonies and, you know, they used to take me out to all of my basketball games, to my rugby games, um, to my football games, you know, because I used to play league basketball, league rugby, league football. So I used to be really fit and really athletic and all of my training sessions, everything like that. They used to take me um, to them. So, you know, Alhamdulillah, I'm grateful for that. But the culture that they had and the culture that I had was completely different. And to merge the two was going to be very difficult. So I'm just wondering, because I'm a parent myself and I'm always observing other parents and incorporating what works. Is there anything that stands out in your mind that your parents did well raising you that you'll pass on to your kids maybe? Freedom. Alhamdulillah, my parents gave me a lot of freedom. Now this works, this can go two ways. Double-edged sword. Yeah. If you give your child too much freedom, right, they're going to go, they can go completely down the wrong path and they can stay in that path. Okay. Now, the second option is you give your child freedom, you let them make the decisions that they want to make and then learn from their mistakes. And that's what my parents did with me. They gave me the freedom to, to go out, stay out late. They gave me the freedom to not always check up on me. They gave me the freedom to, to kind of do the things that I wanted to do, explore the things that I wanted to do. And that helped me a lot because I never felt restricted. So I felt that anything that I was going to do, my parents, they they let me do it. You know, of course, yes, I did things behind their backs like, like every child does. And there has to come to a point where, as yourself, as a parent as well, that you have to know that you can do everything you can for your child to nurture them, to create that nur- nature nurture environment for them. But there will come a time that when that child starts to become a young adult, they are they will be held accountable for their actions and they will need to take accountability for the things that they do and they need to learn from their mistakes and that's what my parents let me do um up until this age as well they let me they let me learn from my mistakes they let me move out to uni they let me do the job i want to do they they allowed me to go into the degree where i wanted to and they supported me they then um, supported me in a way in a decision where i left my career they then supported me with other things decisions that i've made so that has helped me and having a conversation with my mum the other day and my sister you know we were talking about obviously my little brothers they're always playing up and they don't really listen to my mum and dad that much you know it's, it's more of me having that authoritative figure over them they're going through that phase that you went through yeah right so but i didn't have me they have me so you know things are very changing i'm very regimented and i am strict with my little brothers because you know i'm, I'm trying to create that environment for them where you know, you are going to learn from your mistakes, but you're going to have to learn things the hard way. And there is certain ways of doing things. And especially as a child, especially because we grew up in a very different generation. Do you know what I mean, I know you're a couple of years older than me. And I can't have to throw that in there. Yeah, right? man. <laughs> so, Don't expose my age. Yeah. <laughs> so I know we grew up in a very different generation. Do you know yeah, what I mean? So 100%. Um, I think having having that authority figure of my little brothers where i'm not just their big brother i am i am the person that whatever i say with them goes there is no questioning that there is no talking back and that's just the way life is sometimes if your parent says something you can't argue back to that but because there is that argumentative phase with say for example if it's with my parents then that's where i step in i'm like yo listen this is not how it's going to work you know if you're not going out you're not going out get home now get to bed straight straight like that you know what i mean and and they will not talk back to me they've never spoken back to me because they know that i'm the big brother and what i'm saying is it comes from a place not just of 
love and care but there's just some things in life you have to suck up and some things in life where you don't have a say over and as a kid you don't have a say over where you're going to go what you're going to do it's just it's just the reality of it we are your guardians we have a responsibility over you the decisions that we make for you you might not like it at the time but you learn when you're older and i only know this now because the decisions that my parents made for me and that they encouraged me to make i only realize now 10 10 12 years later kids are doing all kinds of madness at the moment mm. have you heard of that guy mizzy yeah Recently walking in for context for people that don't know, this guy Mizzy was going around with a gang of people into people's homes. And as you can imagine, the children there, there's people living in there. And I don't see how people think that's acceptable. In fact, they've come to the conclusion that this is all right, man, this is normal. Mm. And I think that's due to what we talked about earlier that stems from a lack of a father figure or masculine figure in the home. Mm. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. And I watched the interview as well because I saw the videos and, you know, without even having to get into it much, it's it's a perfect representation of when you don't have the authority figure in your life, whether it's your fault or it's not, do you know what I mean? There comes to a point where as a young man, you become an adult. You need to know and be able to differentiate what is wrong and what is right. And if you don't have a disparity between the two, you're going to lead yourself into a very dark spiral. Like I saw, I saw the interview and, you know, the, the kid is lost. And when you say that a lot of the kids are in this TikTok generation now, there's a reason why my little brothers don't have phones. I've said to them, you're not having any mobile devices until you're 18, until you're in uni, because then whatever decisions you make, that's on you. But I've done everything in my power that I can to make sure that you guys go to mosque, you read your Quran, you fall in love with Salah. You know, I never shout at them to read Salah. I never peck their heads to read Salah. I'm, I said to them, look, listen, I'm going to pray. Are you going to pray with me? Have you prayed? Okay, you know what to do. If you don't want to pray, don't pray. That's on you. Because you have to teach kids from a very young age that they will be held accountable for their actions. Do you know what I mean? And always instilling the value of brotherhood to them, stay sticking together. That's the, that's, that's the main thing. And I love a, that, bro. You know, alhamdulillah, that, that, that's the reason why, because I've seen what TikTok does to a generation because I've got younger cousins and I've seen what it does. And there is no way that I'm letting that happen to my younger brothers. So whether it's a very bitter pill for them to swallow at the moment, because they have a tab, they have their tabs where they can play their games, but we set limits to that as well. Because again, at a very young age for children, you have to make them realize that you cannot get what you want. Nothing is about instant gratification and you really have to suffer. Soak it up. Soak it up. It's going to be difficult. Do you get what I mean? You, if, if from a young age you can be, if, if you can be the odd one out from your friends, that's brilliant because all of his friends have phones except for him. He doesn't have a phone. And, and I said to him, I'll get you a brick phone, but he doesn't want to show it to you in front of his boys. Do you know what I mean? He's at that age now. He's 12 years old. He wants, he wants to cool things. But I said to him, like, you know, the main thing that I instill into my little brothers and I treat them like they're my own kids, like I literally treat them like they're my own kids. I'm, I'm harsh on them. But at the same time, every single day, I'll tell them both, I love you. I give them a kiss. I say, I love you. I sit them on my lap and they'll just rest their head on my shoulders, both of them. And they're 11 and 12 now. And it's been like that since they were one. And when they were on my lap and I was feeding them milk or changing their nappies, it's the very same thing right now. And that's the relationship that I want to have with my younger brothers. And I think it's very important that as a man, if you have younger brothers, if you have a son, these are the things that kids remember the most. It's not when you take them out. It's not when you buy them toys. It's not when you take them places. These things, if you have a child, you know, the things that they remember is the things you instill into them, the values you instill into them. Do you tell your child, I love you? Do you tell your brothers, your siblings that I love you? 90% of all homeless and runaway children, 63% of teen suicides, 85% of all children and teens with behavioural disorders come from fatherless homes. If a man and a wife raise a child, they are less likely to end up in jail or have the same chance as children raised by just their father. So what that, let me break that down. So imagine husband and wife raising a child, hmm. right? That child has the same chance of going to jail as the father raising a child on his own. That just goes to show that having unity with a family is very important. Having a father is really important because or having that masculine figure or, or that authority figure, because quite often there are mums and I know, I know single mothers and some of my friends who don't have fathers, their mothers have done an excellent job at raising, raising kids. And sometimes people have, have a mum and a dad, but the father is still absent. He might be present physically, 
but he's 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 not there. He's at work. He doesn't look after. And I've seen this firsthand. Do you get what I mean? Do you know, hundred percent. And that's I'll I'll say this as a last thing on this topic. It's not enough to have a father at home to be present. Even with children with a father present in the home, the average schoolboy only spends about thirty minutes per week with one-on-one -on -one conversation with his father. For comparison, the same boy on average will spend about 44 hours per week watching TV, playing video games and surfing the net. Exactly. So then who's raising the kids then? Yeah. Is it the father that's raising the kids or is it social media that's raising your children? Wow. Is your Is your child getting raised by TikTok, YouTube and Instagram or is your child getting raised by mum, dad and the, the values that they teach in schools and in mosque? Following the timeline, continue with it. So... About 21, you graduated from university. Before that, you got a personal a personal trainer qualification yeah. at 19. Yeah. One thing I want to ask you, bro, like, why did you get a qualification? Because that's someone else's plan A, hmm. whereas you had a better plan A, which is an audiology yeah. degree. So why, why not waste your time, but like, why, yeah. why dabble in that when you've got a better route? No, absolutely, man. I think so initially, and a lot of people don't actually know this. So when I, f when I first started uni, um, I was doing sport and exercise sciences, and then I wanted to do my integrated masters in sports medicine and then become a sports doctor. I always had a vision of being that guy who runs out onto the field when a, when a, when a footballer or an athlete is down and I'm quickly fixing them up. I'm doing something. So I, because my passion was with sport and with with medicine and with helping people, I thought that's the direction I was going to go in. But then I realized that um, whilst I was doing the course, you know, it's not actually who I wanted to be, you know, and another big thing is I have a fear of blood and needles. So we used to do dissections. So on the on the eighth floor, um, I think it was the eighth floor, we used to have a, uh, it's called a cadaver lab. So it's a lab with dead bodies. Yeah. So you would, we would then dissect the dead bodies. Okay. And so there'd be like, there'd be a trunk, there'd be a torso, there'd be arms, and then we'd inspect these different parts. So we'd get to know the real human anatomy and where each different joint connects, where the muscles connect and where each tendon is, the bones and everything like that. I used to faint every time I'd go to the labs. Really? I used to pass out, bro. Do you get what I mean? And I used to ring to my mum. I was like, mum, it's happened again. She goes, all right, pick yourself up, better back. So we used to do it every two weeks. Every two weeks I would faint. Not just that, doing the course, I felt like, because again, I was the only Asian person there. Do you get what I mean? There's about 100 of us on the course. And then I realized from speaking to the other people, like they didn't really have a passion for it. They were doing it just because they wanted to do sports science. But I gave my heart and soul into to getting onto this course and to getting into, you know, a Russell Group uni, which I thought at the time was the best thing I was going to do, getting into this red brick uni, getting into this amazing uni. And then I, I realized, okay, this isn't what I want to do. So I then dropped out of that six six months later, and then and I then pursued my personal training course. I was like, I'm going to go into audiology, but I still want to have that personal training course because I wanted to do something in the online world. So at 19, I thought, okay, let me dabble into this. So going back to where you know you have to try a lot of things. So then I, I did the personal training course and be, purely because I wanted to do it online because I knew because I was working at Carphone Warehouse pretty much full time then. And I was then um, I was also like doing odd jobs, you know, takeaway jobs, delivery jobs, stuff like that. So then I realized, OK, look, listen, I need to do this. I did it, got the, got the qualification because I already knew pretty much everything that the course did. I said to the course leaders, look, listen, this is who I am. This is what I do. Test me on the spot. I'll answer anything. Right let me just sit the exams. I don't want to go through the course content. And they said, okay, listen, you're going to have to go through some of the content, but finish it. So I finished the personal training. It was, I think it was a 14 or 16 week, 14 or 16 week course. But because I joined in August, I started, and I would have started uni near to the end of September. I had a month and a half to do a 16 week course. I finished it in about five weeks. I said, okay, listen, I'm just going to, I'll do some of the content. I'll attend some of the classes, but let me just sit the exams. I did that. I passed. And then just in the nick of time to then start my degree, Obviously, then I started my degree a year and a bit into it. I realized I don't want to be an audiologist. And I was like, oh, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? Why did it, you want to be an audiologist at that point? When I started going into the placements, I really hated the placements because, you know, having somebody t telling me, oh, you're doing this wrong, you're doing that wrong. And I just used to get, you know, really anxious about going to placement. And I hated it because I'd be going to placement in either Hull or York or Leeds. And then I'd be driving back home to Manchester on Thursday night, working Saturday, Sunday, going back Sunday night um, after I've done my car from warehouse and then after I've done my delivery and my um, my delivery job, I then drive back and then I drive back again from Leeds to Hull. So it was a lot. 
and I, I wasn't enjoying it and I thought you know what I need to I'm going to drop out so what I used to do in the summer of every every year of uni I used to get a full time job somewhere you know I used to lie and be like yeah I'm going to be here I've dropped out of uni so I worked at Virgin Media and I was, I was at the Virgin Media business and so I was 19, 20 I was 20 I think and and then I think I was earning about 34,000 then okay because I was there for about 4 months and that's like when you calculate the monthly that's how much I was on track to achieve and I felt like yo for me at the time, that was a lot of money. And, you know, long story short, I, I saw that I looked at graduate degrees, transitioning from the first year to the second year of uni, um, I saw the Aldi graduate scheme and um, the area manager. So I was fixated in my head that I'm going to be an area manager now. Come to the third year of uni, near to the end, I realised, wow, I'm actually a really good audiologist. Like, I'm really good with the patients and the the pleasure I get from just helping these patients and working with them, even though... Like sometimes when I would have the opportunity to lead an appointment by myself and then the audiologist would be watching me and, you know, I'm making the patient feel comfortable and everything like that. For me, that was like, wow, this is this what my superpower is, you know, to to, to just resonate with people and to help people. So then I was like, ah, oh, damn, but I've already done the Aldi application. It's like a five stage process. They choose you from like thousands of people. I never wanted to work in the NHS um, as an audiologist because I think the starting with any, when, when you start in any um, field in just working for the NHS, it's like 27 grand. And and for me, I set the standard high. And whilst that can be someone's um, way of living and, you know, not to knock any kind of salary or anything like that, but as an individual, you have to know your worth and you have to know what what you're willing to do to get to the places where you want to be and effectively that, that's not what I was willing to do you know, I'm not going to be there sat nine to five earning less than 30 grand sorry that's not me so especially when you tasted that 34k in the beginning exactly, so that, why would you go down exactly it's good that you touched on that because I said to myself mentally I'm never I'm never going to get a job less than 34k yeah okay so then I was like the only way the only, only way up now is to go to the Aldi thingy so they were on a 44k starting salary jeez they, Aldi pay well man <laughs> yeah so they give you they give you a company car and again for me at the time 44k was a lot when I got the email saying you've received you've got the job Job. Wallahi, I was like, I've just got my dream job because at that time I didn't think that any of my businesses were going to succeed much, and I wasn't going to, you know, um, you know, just, you know, be successful with this. So I thought, okay, I then had a five-year plan for what I wanted to do, to do with Aldi. And for those of you, for the people that don't know, the way the Aldi area manager grad scheme works is you start on 44k the year after that it's an 11 grand increase and then after that it's another 11 grand increase and then another 11 grand increase and then another 11 grand increase so then by year five you're on six figures and then you can probably aim to go for a to be a director that's what my goal was that was your five-year yeah. plan i want to be a director i did that for three and a half months four months lo and behold i didn't like it. i hated it bro you know i just didn't get on the, the way the, the way it was so regimented and the way um the, the corporate structure of it i realized that that's not who i am because i was speaking to some of my friends who were audiologists they were working as locums so as locums it's a, it's a bit better i think as a locum and again i'll be very transparent about it because people need to know how much do you earn doing this kind of stuff as yeah. a locum you'll probably earn anywhere between about depends if you're down south or up north between about 39 to about 48 grand and working as a locum. Locum meaning you're private? Uh, so I'd be working with an agency and they'd put me in the hospital to, and okay. I'd, I'd be contracted with the hospital. So then whilst I was at Aldi, I was like, okay, I'm chasing this six-figure salary. I'm on track for the six-figure salary. You know, this is, this is the life I'm going to live. I, you know, they gave me the car. Everything was like, everything was paid for. I didn't pay for fuel. I didn't pay for anything. I was like, this is it. So I now need to make a huge decision and to leave. So I then left, right? And I thought I'm gonna I'm gonna go into my business. Business wasn't going well. I got scared. I then worked as a locum. Then I realized, you know what? I actually want to become a private audiologist, stay in that field for two years, okay, and then have my own practice or something something within that realm. So when you say just for the audience, when you say business, are we talking about the online coaching or are we talking about your videography company? Everything. So combined, I mean, yeah, yeah. Everything. It just wasn't. It just. I was like, this isn't the life I want to live. Do you get what I mean? Like, was you building your social media following at the time? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the social media following has always been a constant, constant growth in constant, the background. Yeah, yeah. Const, constant okay. building that because effectively that's the brand. And if I was to, if if I do brand partnerships and brand deals, you know that that that's a lot of the metrics and that is what's going to help me. So, so then I got my private qualification. I passed that exam. I then I thought, okay, this is the job that I want to do and I'm going to balance it with my business, but my audiology will be my main focus. So I then went onto that job, but then I realized another thing that it was, it was that there was somebody else still telling me what to do. Even though as an audiologist, you have a lot of autonomy over your clinics and how you do things. It was, it was a fact of the matter that I can't wake up in the morning and decide how my day is going to go. I'm at the mercy of somebody else. Sound like you don't like authority in some ways. It's true. Yeah. 
it's, yeah. it's true. I'm the same. Yeah. I'll, be, I'll be real with you. I'm yeah. the same. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And in the, it's a vice, and at the same time, it's, it's it's a good thing. If there is so many people out there that have created businesses for themselves who have taken this risk, why do I have to be that person that has to work um, a, a structured routine nine to five job? Like, wallahi, by Allah, you can put me on two hundred k, three hundred k salary, whatever. But if it's working for somebody else, I'm not going to do it. I wouldn't do it. And I can only say that because, number one, um, I was in two situations. I was put in a very authoritative figure. If I was an area manager, I had five multi-million stores that I was going to manage, right? And I was training to manage them. Um, and then the six-figure ti- the six, the whole six-figure title was there. The company car was there. As a private audiologist, that, that track for six-figure salary was there. That, that um, autonomy of running your own clinics was there. I had it, but it just did not phase me at all, you know, you know, being on track for that amount of money and realizing that you can offer me a, a role for 200 grand, but if there's someone above me saying, okay, you need to do it this way, you need to do this, we need to do this, that's not gonna work. And it's not from a place of arrogance. People need to understand, and this is what my parents thought, and my sister, she goes, you're just arrogant. You know, uh, you're gonna have to accept authority. Yes, I do accept authority from my parents. I accept authority from my ustad, from my teachers. But where I find it difficult to accept authority is is from a place of work because I know what my capabilities is, what my capabilities are and it boils down to this if you really want to be able to kind of if if you're stuck in life and you want to be able to just take that next step you have to realize what your own value is and what you bring to the table. I then took the I then took the step as to realize okay you know what I'm gonna quit. Lots to summarize there, bro. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, you, 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 you zoomed <laughs> over on that one. <laughs> yeah, but um, no, I want to mention because look, what people are wondering, what is this business? What's causing you to leave your job? Yeah. Uh, so I need to go into the details now. Of course, man. To give some value to the audience, right? Let's start with the social media because um, I, I think you some way you some way leverage your audience and. Mm. That, that feeds into your creative focus, feeds into the mm. videography, I, I would imagine, like a funnel, basically, mm. and you can get clients from there. So you've got 126K followers at the moment, right? Mm. We've come to a point where social media following is worth more than a Cambridge degree. Yeah. Let's put it that way. So you have the unfair advantage of building a social media following. I say unfair, but we can talk about mm. how you got there because we see, bro, what we see now, we're seeing, yo, Riaz is killing it, man. He's been sponsored by Gymshark. He's been sponsored by MyProtein. He's got 126K followers, but they don't know the backstory of how you build that audience for starters. So, cause that's the opening gate is into it, I, supp- mm. I, I suppose in some ways. Yeah. So let's just talk about how you built that quickly. Um, give, us, give us an overview, how you built your audience, what it took, the blood, sweat and tears. Before I go, go into that, one thing I want to touch on is followers don't always mean money and followers don't always mean that your business will succeed. I know coaches who have probably 10K followers they probably have more clients than me. I've, I've worked with these case studies and, I, and I've, I've worked with these different mentors that your followers, it doesn't matter how many followers you have. You could have a million followers, but if you can't engage with the audience, you're not gonna, you're not gonna be able to, you're not gonna be able to win them over and you're not gonna be able to, because they need to know who you are. They need to be able to connect with you. So that, that, that's, that's the first thing. Um, secondly, how I built my, how I built my, my page there's 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 no secret there's no there's no kind of magic pill but the things that i did to go from zero to 126k well i did it over a course of five years where i've seen people do over the course of a couple of months i played the long game bro i played the long game so i i, I was kind of there through each instagram change through each instagram how it leveraged different things you know and I've been creating content for about six years now and I've spent over two and a half thousand hours just there creating content. And what it boiled down for me was I did the whole follow and unfollow thing when I was, you know, in the, into the early stages of it. But for now, it's not even about how much value you provide in your content. It's not about how you e- educate your audience. It's not about how you entertain your audience. These things are not exactly going to make your page grow. It's how you can make your audience be feel emotion it's how you link emotion into each of your posts into each of the content pieces that you create because at the end of the day people always want to feel something as human beings we want to feel something we want to feel whether that's feelings of happiness anger sadness or despair there is always a yearning of a feeling and you need to convey that feeling to your audience i'm not that great at it to be honest like in my videos like i don't produce great content that goes viral 
I just produce content on a very, very consistent basis. Like, I'll say this now, there's not a lot of people that can ma- match my work rate. I'm not the smartest. I'm not the one with the most successful business. You know, I don't have the most most money in my account. But majority of people put them in front of me. I'll, I'll work them any day of the week. I'll outwork the majority of people. But that's not the mentality I had. The mentality I had was I need to outwork who I am and who I need to be better than who I was yesterday. That's my mentality. So going back to how I then grew the page was yeah, yeah. Is that consistently, I've been posting every other day for the past five and a half years. Every how, other bro? day. Bar taking a break when I was in Ithakaf and when I had a when I had a few family deaths, I took like a three, four day break. But pretty much every other day I've been posting. Sometimes I used to post twice a week. So if you look, I've probably got close to 900 posts now. And then if you think about that on, on every other day, so 365 divided by two, you're looking about uh, 100 and, 180 approximately. Times that by about five and a half, you're looking about 900, but just about 900 almost, right? So that's one thing I said to myself, post every other day or every post day. Post every other day, Yeah. right? And but you did that for how long for? Five and a half years. Five and a half years. And just to put that into context, bro, for the first, how many years did you see any results or no results? Or? For the first five years, no results. When you say no results, what are we talking in terms of follower count? Is it likes? Um, for the, from, from, how are you measuring from it? From year zero to year four and a half, roughly. Yeah. Uh, about 14K followers from year four and a half to now, fast forward a year. For, so in this past year, um, it's grown by 100 and. 15,000, an extra wow. 115,000 in this past year. Why? Because I realized who I am, what my niche was, and I doubled down on that. I created content, not that I think is good, but what I know the audience will love. I created content which I'm passionate about, which is faith. And what else am I passionate about? Fitness. Mm. What else am I passionate about? Mindset. What else am I passionate about? Helping people intertwine these things together. And then you have a formula of a formula of kind of creating endless content and producing as much value as you can. If you could, let, let's say you're starting from scratch now, yeah. yeah. Could you skip that not to four, not to five years of graft, and could you go viral, let's say, within a year? And for example, knowing what you know now, your knowledge and stuff like that, do you reckon the knowledge that you've acquired now, you could go not to 100k with with what you just said? Yeah, absolutely. In in less than six months really 100 percent, bro 100 percent. because i've spent again i've spent two about over two and a half thousand hours creating content but how many hours have i spent actually learning you yeah. know i've spent over over thousands of hours learning and learning human psychology learning how people work learning how social media works and at the end of the day you can never know everything and at the end of the day i don't have the perfect formula but knowing what i know now um is one thing that's always going to work, no matter what, is just keep on putting stuff out there. Keep on, stu- keep on putting stuff out there. Don't stop. If your if your content is rubbish, if if it's not getting views, carry on, carry on. I mean, it's insane if you do the same thing over and over again and expect different results. Then you're a bit crazy. But if you're doing something over and over again and you're making changes, you're seeing what works and what doesn't work, and then you reverse engineer that and then you do something else. Then you'll see you'll see results not just in social media but in business as well. I I change the way I do business. I change the way I do things. And you know what? I'm gonna be I'm gonna be very straight with you, bro. I don't have a successful business. None of my businesses are successful. But define success. What successful money? What? How, how much you? Give me a bit for, more. So for me, I want to be able to have a life where I don't have to think about the price tag, or I, I don't have to think about this, or I don't have to second guess if I'm gonna. Um, get this for a family member if I'm going to make this huge purchase or something. Okay, so, so you are successful, but you still got a goal. You still want to be a millionaire, for example. Absolutely. Right? But you course. might be hitting six figures. Very good point. Very good point. Yeah, because, so that is successful, bro. Because it is, It is. I think success is um, It's very... It's, subjective. It's subjective. I think for, for me, because the standard I've set for myself and because I'm nowhere near that standard, you know, I haven't, you know, I've given myself a time frame. You know, I've physically written down a time frame for when I'm going to be a millionaire. I've written that. And by Allah's grace, you know, I'll do whatever I can. Wallahi, I'll do whatever I can. If you want to buy things without looking at the price tag, make sure you be working without looking at the, the clock. clock. That's Absolutely. deep. Absolutely. So, okay. So you're doing the online coaching, right? You've, we've got an overview of how you built your following. You're confident that you can build that within a year, right? So it's possible. In terms of like, bro, you know, online coaching, right? Yeah. So how did that come about? And because obviously you made a decision, a tough decision to leave mm. your job. So obviously generating some form of income. Yeah. 
what was what's the business model like? What's the infra infrastructure like? Because I think online coaching now is a hot topic. Everyone's yeah. pretty much doing it that I've come of across course, of online. Course. Yeah. People are doing one step further. They're teaching people how to be coach. Coaches, they're making yeah. a killing out of that. Absolutely. I man. think that's the next step for you, man, in some yeah, ways. That's the thing, man. I think with the structure with how mine works is it's, it's, it's very straightforward. I've got I've got my app, I've got the website, I've got the the back end model of how things work. And again, that's working with developers and companies to to help me to to redefine that and to actually build it. And so you know, the, the business model works very simply. You know, a lead comes in, I get a notification, I contact them, set up a meeting either with my assistant or with me, and then um, I just kind of work work across it from there, kind of just signing the client. And then once the client has signed, it's pretty straightforward, but it's extremely difficult because... <sighs> I didn't really want to say this, but I'm not actually a successful coach. I'm not a successful online coach. You know, I don't have the most amount of clients. I don't have the, you know, the amount of clients that I want. Um, I'm not making the amount that I want. And I think I feel like I need to put this out there because I get so many people coming up to me saying, oh, Riaz, man, you're doing so well. You're doing this, you're doing that. And I'm like, first of all, say Allahumma barik, you know, you know I, I want to be protected from Nazar. But, but second of all, Wallahi, it's, it's not what it looks like. I promise you, bro, it's not what it looks like. Sometimes I'm sat there, bro, I'm sat there for an hour and I look at my laptop and then I start crying, bro. Because I think, what, how am I going to build this life? How am I going to get to X, Y, and Z? I then realise that it's going to be extremely tough because, believe it or not, I actually don't like being on the camera. <laughs> as weird as it sounds, being like considering that I'm always on the camera. Like, if it was up to me, and like, this is a conversation I have to myself with myself quite a lot. If it was up to me, I would probably delete Instagram and I wouldn't have social media. But because it's literally my bread and butter with the business models that I have, they rely on social media. So in one way, I really don't like that. In another way, it's like I can reach so many people and it is who I am. But there is there is this piece of me, there is this part of me which wants to earn money without being on social media, without wants to have that success. Because I know so many successful people who are not on social media. And I'm thinking sometimes, why couldn't I just be like that? Why do I have to be out there? You know, why does it have to be me that's spreading that message, that's that's conveying that message? You know what I mean? Why couldn't it be someone else? I would have rather been low-key earning my money, you know, a decent amount and just live a nice life. But is that because the thing is, there are so many days where I don't feel like it coming onto social media or posting or, or promoting my business. And I was like, oh, this is draining, man. Do I want to do this? And so I've had, I've, I've had that thought of, do I want to carry on with coaching? And it's a battle that I have. With it's a conversation that I have with myself regularly. Do I want to carry on with videography or should I just do something to do with audiology or should I just start another business in, in, in a different field? So it's difficult, man. It's difficult. If you guys come this far in the podcast, hit that like button, man. Because you can see, man, this guy's been brutally honest, man. And you know what? I'm glad you said that, bro, because you're showing, like you said, bro, like it's not what everyone sees, in it? But at the same time, bro, I'm confident you're going to go far. You know why? You believe in yourself. You know you got value, bro. You know you got value. Deep down, you know you're better than a lot of these coaches out there, bro. Do you know what I mean? And you care about the community. You care about the people that you work with, bro. You said it with your audiology. I see it, bro, and your passion is there, bro. I just think you need to place yourself in front of the right people and it will blow off. Um, have you read Alex Homos's book? I've not read it, but I've heard, I've heard of him quite bro, a lot. Bro, you need to read that. That is up your street, bro. I guarantee you that book, right? You're going to 10 extra income. Read that book, bro. Honestly, it's right up there for what's, you, bro. What's it called? 100 million offers. Okay. So basically, so it's basically you're just placing yourself in, I don't want to say low level clients, bro, but like, yeah. Do you know what I mean? The hard, that's, that's what actually they're rapid fire in the beginning, right? Like what's the most annoying type of, of customers you can have? Mm. And it's the one that want everything for nothing. Mm. We don't want them, we don't want them customers, bro. We want the ones that, like you said, like what's your name, Danny? Mm. We want Danny, bro. He does everything, pays the price that you want. That's, uh, the, the only thing is how do you place ourselves in front of that? And that's yeah. what the book teaches you. It's called how to make a grand slam offer. And in conjunction with that, you need to read Russell Brunson's book, which I'm in the middle of reading, right? Dot com secrets. I've seen that. I've, I've, bro, seen, I've not read it, but I've, shout out to Hamza man on YouTube, man. Um, I don't know if you heard of Hamza. He's a personal development guy. Kind of I, guy. Think, I think I've seen him. Shout out to him, bro. He recommended it, right? And he has an online community now, right? Yeah. And he's charging like a thousand pound, I think it is, between five hundred pound and a thousand pound per person to be just part of a community hmm. online. And he hops on a call every two, every day, sorry, at some point and coach someone live and stuff mm. like that. 
that's the level we want to get to, right? Where you're charging that kind of price. But yeah. the average, this is, this is why, I'm going to say it, bro. I'm going to say it. This is why I don't target Muslims per se. Hmm. Because, bro, like, it's, first of all, it's so diverse. You're talking about Turkish Muslims, South Asian Muslims. It's too general. Do you know what? I'm so... Uh, it's too I'm general, I'm so glad bro. you said that. Should I tell you this? Probably 50% of my leads that come through are from India, Nigeria, yeah. Ethiopia, Egypt, Turkey, um, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh. And what do these have in common? The less economically developed countries yeah. like because my content reaches those people because i am a quote-unquote muslim influencer do you know what i mean like one of my videos did about 2.5 million views do you know how many leads i got from that how, guess how many coaching leads i got from that that video that got 2.5 million views guess 50 guess again more guess just guess just guess i'll, I'll give you three guesses guess again I'll, I'll, give me a clear open no, high. just guess again 100 guess again okay no it's probably less than it so i don't know between 50 and 100 that's zero say really yeah whoa that th this is when i say that followers and views don't mean that you're don't gonna get business. Jack. that i got 2.5 million views on that video and, and over the course i was tracking how much engagement i was getting on my website and how many leads were coming through the leads would only come through when i'd post a direct video um talking about coaching or showing a transformation or really specifying in my niche and that kind of video would only get about 11 to 25k views but that generates more potential business for me. So then I realized that those videos which feed into my ego with the views and the followers, they don't actually gain me in business. So I'm, I'm kind of trying to take a shift into, yes, I'm still trying to promote Islam and, uh, and faith, but at the, at the same time that like, I am a business. And but, but I used to think like that, but forget that. I'm gonna be real, I'm gonna say it first here. It's normal to have a nine to five, earn money. You don't think I'm gonna promote Dean there. Yeah, It's a job, man. Yeah. Same with your social media, bro, it's a job. I think the Muslims seem to be focused more, not feel guilty, and just go out yeah. and earn. Just grab your money, bro. Like you, said it, you said it in the beginning, like don't be afraid or something like to you, want more. To want more, and like, exactly. And I think it's it's really important that you that you touched on that because as Muslims, I think it's so important to actually earn money and to earn to earn um, you know a, a, a generous income. Exactly, that's what Tai Kamal's all about, man. Like just do your bit. And then, then leave the rest to God, man, at the end exactly. of the day. And I think that's it, man. Read them two books, bro. And I guarantee your income's going to 10x, bro. You're going to charge a lot higher as well. Yeah. I don't know how much you're charging now. And uh, obviously, if people want to get in touch, they'll course, get in touch yeah, with you. And tr trust me, this guy knows his stuff, man. Like, he's well knowledgeable. Take advantage of the years and years of graft he's putting in, in there. Um, look, we're, we're going to go on to a concluding topic, yeah? Just to go back onto, bro, the social media side of things, right? Hmm. You mentioned that you put in um basically you made a content or release content every other day right yeah right now i do on a daily basis i've been bro, doing it on a daily basis for a long time now bro talk to me of how you become this machine man what does your content creation process look like bro okay so uh, in order for me to create successful content that's going to reach people and generate business as well I, I do a few different things okay so before i never used to have a content plan i used to edit on the day and it used to be you know i used to be chasing my own tail but now what I do is, so I will dedicate a day or two, okay? I'll record a bunch of different videos. I'll, I'll research, so I'll spend, so when it comes to the end of a month, near to the end of a month, but first two weeks into, into the month, I will then start planning for the, the month after, the, the second month after that, okay? So I'll start planning, making notes on the kind of content I want. I'll do my research, spend a couple of hours researching what's working, what's not working, what's hot right now, what I can reverse engineer. So that's the first step. So I'll have on my notes, just roll random video ideas, okay? The thing is, I don't have any scripts for any of my videos. So when I record it, just go. What's, what comes to my mind? So do you brainstorm like topic, this is what I'm going to batch record in one day. Is that what you say? No. No, no. So, so, so how it works is I'll have a bunch of ideas, okay? okay. And then one day, um, I'll just sit down. I'll be like, okay, um, I'm going to record like five or six videos, okay? So then I'll look at the ideas. I'll, so the topic will be... Um, I don't necessarily always add the topic, but I add the hook. So say, for example, if you're a Muslim, so that will be my hook for a few videos. If you're a Muslim and you're struggling with this, if you're a Muslim and you feel like you're not connecting with your face, if you're the a Muslim... The first three yeah, seconds are very important on a video, right? Yeah, and whoever's a Muslim, then yeah. yeah. Or um, things you should do in your 20s. Um, if you're somebody who's in your 20s and you're struggling. To start off with a question, right? Yeah. Your video. A question, something a bit emotive, something like... Yeah. If you are, you could even get, even even make it more specific. Um if you're if you're a Bengali Muslim if you're a Bengali Muslim guy between the age of twenty to twenty six, I need you to listen to this. 
majority of the time, any Bengali guy who is between the age of 20 and 26 is going to listen to what I say. I'm actually going to write that as a video idea. <laughs> <laughs> I've not done that. So, um, so, so that's what I'll do. I'll then batch record. Okay. So what I'll do is before going into a new month, I'll make sure I'll have all of the content ready for that month. So all of my June content is already ready and planned. And um, wow. So wait, let me break that down. Sorry, bro. You went, went over my head. That so yeah. So a month in advance. Yeah. You have the ideas written down. Yeah. Give me roughly how many bullet points you have. Uh, about between hundred to two hundred fifty. What? If we can say ten or something. Roughly. So <laughs> so hundred, and then you pick a day in the week. Yeah. You hit record. Just go off top of your head. Yeah, Make not through, not through all of them because a lot of them are not just um, talking videos as well. Yeah, a lot of them. What I'll do is I'll get because the good thing about recording everything that you do, uh, and and here's probably here's the number one tip that I'll give if you want to really succeed on social media and make a business from it. Record everything you do. Record everything you do. Just imagine that your life is a movie and you're recording everything. I would record everything. I'd record myself eating. I'd record myself going to work. I'd, myself, I'd record myself working, tidying, cleaning, because you can repurpose that content. So then what I'll do is if I'm having like a, a religious quote kind of a video, I will combine those videos and I will make something like that. But in terms of the talking one, in terms of the topics. So we write down bullet points, okay? A month in advance, I'll have the bullet points n noted for the videos that I'm gonna make, okay? And I've only been doing this for the past couple of months now. I'll write down the videos I wanna make, and then and then if if throughout the day, because throughout the day in random moments, like just then, if I had my phone on me, I would have just wrote it down, but I'm gonna write after. But literally whenever a video com a video idea comes into my head, I just get out my phone and I just write it. You know what I mean? Right. Wherever, wherever I am. So I write down two months beforehand, and then what I do is the next month after that, I will start to record for the following month, for that second month. So imagine we're in January. I yeah. wrote I wrote down everything in January. January, okay. The things that I've wrote down for January will coincide with Feb and March. Okay. okay. I'll then start to record for March, near to the end of Jan, mid Feb. Okay. When when are you releasing them then? So then I'll, I'll, so I'll, January for example. When are you releasing them? February, March. Uh, Feb, March. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So sometimes, I get it. But sometimes I freestyle it. Like I'll re like I'll probably go home. And if, I, if I've noticed I've got a bit of a fresh trim and, uh, you know, yeah. like I think the lighting's good and I'm, yeah. and, and I'm pretty free, I've done what I need to do, I'll just grab my tripod out and I'll just record some videos off the back of it and the, the, the content. That's why you me. carry your tripod everywhere, isn't it? Everywhere. You're doing behind the scenes right now, it's you're putting it right I mean? in the studio, so yeah. mad. So that's amazing, bro. So basically you're turning your life into a bit of a documentary, just yeah. record rather than create, document. Yeah. And this is the, 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 the best thing, the best thing about, you know, being able to be a successful creator is just document your life. Mm. Document your life. Treat your life as a documentary. And and Gary Vee even said this. And I, I'll be honest, but I took a lot of knowledge from Gary Vee during my younger ages. Um, right now, he just talks a lot of nonsense. I'm going to be honest. He, he provides a lot of value, but a lot of value for the people who are in the very early stage where they're like, oh, you know, Gary, man, I don't know what to do, dude. You know, <laughs> yeah. where, where's my life going, man? Like, <laughs> spot on, bro. And, 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 then, and then he's like, uh, you know what you got to do? You just got to quit your job, man. You just got to quit your job. <laughs> yeah, that's a clip, that. <laughs> that, that is sick. And then, and then he's he like, oh, just, uh, just live in your just live in the basement, dude. Just live in your parents' <laughs> basement, dude. And then just tell your mom to f off, man. <laughs> and then, um, so, oh god, that's but, hilarious. <laughs> like, like I said, like I learned stuff from Jigo. I mean, and <clears throat> so that's uh, yeah. So that, that that's going going back to that. Um, yeah, that it's just kind of creating an abundance. But yeah, so that's so that's how you be consistent, essentially, mm -hmm. right? Just batch record pretty yeah. much within a day. Yeah. And then just bash it out. Mm. So how do you get like I know you, I noticed you carry your camera in the gym and stuff mm. like that, right? So how do you get out of the fear of people watching you? Do people mm. ever stop you and say, "Bro, man, don't be recording here"? Or, do you know what I mean? Like, do you get all these comments, or yeah. do you have that fear? Be honest with me. Like, do you have that fear of people watching you? Because you said you don't like being on camera. Mm. So I've I've had everything kind of that we've, that we've included, and kind of going back to how I don't like being on camera. I really don't like the whole face of always oh, showing my face and talking and this and that. You know, it, it was really difficult for me in the initial stages, but the the way to get out of having that fear of what people think of you not just with whether you've got your camera in the in the gym or wherever it is is just realizing that majority of the time you're not going to see those people again obviously yes if you're in the gym you are and you either build a healthy relationship with them they're interested in what you do or they just don't like you well, <laughs> that's the end of it bro you know you, you we, we live in a we live in a world where not everybody will you know like what we do or be accustomed to us you, you simultaneously you had obviously the business of online coaching and then simultaneously sorry you had the creative focus right so yeah where does that where is that fitting into the mix and how's that working out for you so 
obviously when I when I in the initial stages in the initial stages of starting my fitness page, I used to edit all of my videos. I used to get my and my boy Imran. Big shout out to Imran. This guy has been a pivotal part of my journey. Like because he used to I used to pass him the camera and he'd just record and he'd do all, everything that I said in the gym. He'd do it like that and he'd record it and you know and. Shout out to his business now. He's got a business called Tint Central. So he does car tinting, everything like that. I used to edit everything and he used to record. And then I'm like, hang on a minute. Why am I never recording stuff? You know, I've got this professional camera. I've spent thousands of pounds. And why do I only edit? So come COVID time, come lockdown, I started to record stuff in the house. And then I used to message loads of different businesses. And I was like, you know, what? I want to start into videography and photography. Mainly videography at first. Long story short, messaged about 50 different businesses. A few of them got back to me, did a few did a few um, free gigs, did a few paid ones. That's how you got your first few clients, yeah, that's doing how free got, work. Yeah, free work. That's and a lesson, guys, man. Yeah. Don't, don't, be afraid. Be, don't be afraid to be, do free work. Don't be afraid to do free work. Do you know what I mean? And then you'll know your value, where your value is placed at. If so, you don't mind me asking, bro, like what did you charge eventually like when you got to your first few clients 50 pound bro really <laughs> yeah it's a lot of work for 50 pound bro, bro so the, the, you know and I, i've said this in every podcast i've been through in, in the every podcast i've been to but the, the first client that i got paid from was i wasn't meant to get paid so i i, I think they've closed the business down what it's called uh, sadas chimney cakes it used to be in bolton then they went to marbella but um um the the guy is called lee um and um so he 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 was of um, I think Hungarian or Bulgarian heritage, and so uh, we spent about three hours shooting this. At the end of it, he pulls out his thingy. He, he just he gives me fifty quid, and he goes, "This is for." You. I said, "No, no, no, no." So I said, "What? Well, how come you pay me for this?" And he said, "And he said, um, well, you spent your time. We worked together nicely, and it was good." And um, but like he gained that fifty quid. Then I was like, "Wow, Do you know, like this guy's paid me. And I wasn't. I didn't expect to get paid." Since then, I stopped doing free work. You know, that was like my fifth suit I did. I didn't do any free work then. I then started to charge like £200, £150, £300. I think I did a wedding once where I did the photography and the videography like on two separate days. And I only charged about £500 for the two of them. It's and, a lot of work, bro. <laughs> and I didn't know. I thought, Wedding's a nightmare. I didn't know. So now, f- now I don't charge anywhere near that. Do you get what I mean? For a, for a f- wedding photography or a videography. Like, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, now I've become skilled in both photography and videography. Now, I prefer video- photography with weddings because it's a lot easier, I'll be honest. Do you get what I mean? I can charge a similar amount as I would with videography and it's less work. So, kind of going down to elaborating now more into creative focus. Yeah. Even though I haven't posted on it in about a year and a half, I've been I've done 30, 50 different projects in between that time. I just never posted it because I knew if I posted, it would probably attract people and clients, which I didn't want. But now I'm at that stage now. Okay, all of the work I've done, which is now mainly my niche is weddings, um, start posting them, start to make more of a, create more of a, a business from that now instead of just taking on the odd project here and there because I need it to intertwined with everything that I do and have another stream of income, which is a regular stream of income. I love the tagline, by the way, helping you connect to your audience. It's a videography company, essentially. Yeah. You do all the promo, the cinematics, yeah, that kind of thing. And everything you learn over the years, you mm. just implying that. Good, good footage, by the way. I've seen your Thank Instagram, you, bro. I appreciate that one. stuff like that. Would you not consider starting your own social media agency where you manage people's socials as well? The thing is, here's a difficult thing. When you work with, for people creating their dream wedding or when you work with them creating their physique or whatever, something like that, you have a lot of control over it and you 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 direct it. You have a lot of direction over it. Do you get what I mean? Now, when you work with different businesses, and I've done this before, this is why I don't do, do into social media marketing because the business owners are very picky and very fussy a lot of the times. And I can't, I can't be bothered with the headache. I'll be honest, you know what I mean? It's, it's too much work for me and I, I just don't see the value I could, I could I could really provide given my level of patience and what I know now because I'm very I'm very upfront and straight with it. Two years ago I would have never turned down a client. Right now I'll say to a client, um, go. I, I said to I said to a guy this one time I said um, I'm gonna I'm gonna cancel your so, so, I'm gonna cancel your subscription. You'll get your money back. You need to find another coach. Like I've worked with videography clients. Why why did why did he piss you off? Because <laughs> do you know what it is? You know and not him in general but as a client as. as talking as, as, as an ex- example client, right? It's just saying, oh, it's been a month and I've not lost any weight. There was one guy who left me, yeah, and I did what I could for him as a client. Bro, 
And I don't understand. And this is why a lot of the times it's the Muslim clients, yeah, that will bring you a pain. Do you get what I mean? You think that, yeah, these Muslim clients, they're going to be good to me. Do you know what I mean? Bro, th- a lot of the time the Muslims are the worst to work with. Do you get what I mean? Worst to work, bro. Expe- I'm telling the you. expectations are here and they'll yeah. do this. So this guy, before he left me, bro, he goes, uh, the income that you earn from me, it's not halal. I'm like, bro, how are you going to say that the income that I didn't earn, that I got from you wasn't halal, bro? I just gave you, it was like, okay, take this refund, bro. I don't need your money, bro. Get out of here if you're going to say stuff like that, bro. Do you get what I mean? So it's like, bro, you're still fat because of you, not because of me. You're overweight and fat. That's on you, bro. Go. Get away. Do you get what I mean? By the way, just to clarify, we're talking about Muslims dealing with Muslims. Yeah. We're not talking about Muslims in general. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because Muslims take advantage of the brotherhood and yeah. all that and they use all the little loopholes yeah. and, all, and all this, use wordings and, yo, that's the worst, bro. Stay away. This is why you need to refocus on who you focus on, Trust man. Me, like, bro. A lot of the try, you know, a lot of the time when you're dealing with the same ethnic ethnic and background as well, there's a lot of mental gymnastics that goes on in there and, you know, they try and... They try mental and, gymnastics, I like that. <laughs> Trust me, bro. They try and, you know, uh, sugarcoat in a way and it's like... 100%, oh, man. 100%. I do want to conclude with the topic... Money management slash business again. What what advice would you give to someone to start off getting good with money? What's the basics? Live below your means. Live, below Live your means. way below your means. So so let me give you an example. A very classic thing, which a lot of um, youngsters like to do. Okay, is finance a car? Okay, first of all, I'm not even going to get into the riba aspect of it. Okay, let's just look at it into into a budgeting aspect of it. Okay, never ever ever make the monthly payment of your car over ten percent of what you earn. So say, for example, if you're earning a net of 3K a month, £300 a month on a car, tick, feasible. That's living below your means or living within your means. If you're earning two grand a month and the monthly payment on your car is 200 okay? Remember, this is just a monthly payment of the car. You do not consider the fuel and the insurance. I'm just talking Are about... Are you measuring it against the percentage of your income? Yeah. That's what you're saying, right? Yeah. So yeah. it should never be 10%, more than 10% of your income. This is to go all out, do what you want with them with 10%. This yeah. is 10%. Yeah, so say, for example, if you're earning 10 grand a month yeah. and your monthly payment on your car is a grand, that's fine. You can afford that. Yeah. That's an affordability. Yeah, yeah. And if you can't buy it twice, then don't, 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 then don't buy it. If you want to take it to a next level, if the monthly payment of you, if you can afford twice the monthly payment of your car, then you can, and you can still live comfortably, then go for it. I basically looked at my expenses, right? Mm. Listed it all down. And I thought, you know what, I'm paying for an iPhone here like £100 a month. Hmm. I thought, let me just get a SIM-only contract. I'm happy with the phone, hmm. right? So I did that and got a SIM-only contract for £18 a month. Hmm. Did a few other bits and bobs. It totaled, out, it totaled out like I had £150 extra spare. So what I did with that is that, well, what you can do with that is invest it, you can save yeah. it. If I save that, for example, £150 times 12 is a certain amount, times up by a certain amount of years, it's actually a few grand. Hmm. I'm just giving an example, do you know what I mean? So hmm. people are actually nowadays are uh, going broke trying to look rich. Exactly. And the ones who have who are actually doing well, they're not showing it in in any way, shape or form. So it just goes down to, you know, who are you really trying to press? Who are you trying to show? And it goes down to the cost of living crisis as well. Yes, there is a cost of living crisis, but what's the solution to the cost of living crisis? Earn more money. Earn more money. And it's easier said than done, but I'm talking to the layman. Yeah, I was going to say, it's yeah. easier said than done. I'm talking, to, said I'm done. talking to the layman. You need to do an audit on yourself. Like a business goes through an audit, do a self audit, do a do a reflective audit where you ask family members to audit you. Like, what am I like? Give me a breakdown. Who am I? People don't want to audit themselves a lot of the time. And I think I can speak for a lot of people. A lot of people, you don't really want to check your bank account a lot of the times. You, you, you're just dreading to go on your bank and account and think, oh, I spent this much, I've got this much. I don't like looking at my account and saying, oh, I've spent so much money this this month. I'm thinking, flip the night. Best place to reach out to you to be coached online, bro? Uh, Instagram, through my website. Get in touch, book a call uh, for videography. Again, DM. And for any other kind of business purposes, email or DM. I'm always available. That's it, man. We'll conclude it there. With that being said, respect. Peace. Assalamu alaikum, bro. Wa alaikum assalam, bro. So my name is Riaz. I'm 24. And oh, I why, so are why are you going formal? Why are you going formal all of a sudden? Bro, Yo, always, what? This, this <laughs> I'm keeping this in, by the way. No, this always happens. <laughs> you know what's what so? I'm about <laughs> We're keeping this in. People like authenticity. Ooh. Yeah, but whatever that word is. Authenticity, yeah. Because I'm being myself regardless. Yeah, because you, so you, you, I remember you like this. Sorry, so, 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 Bro, when you start in a podcast, there's so much happening. Know, the yeah, lights man. are on, the cameras are on. I've got to make you feel comfortable. But now I'm like, listen, I'm five episodes in, whatever. Let's do it, man. This is it, man. No, so I'm Riaz. No, so my name is Riaz. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, 